You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by Myax, one of the fastest options platforms in the world. Myax is now trading options on the Spikes Volatility Index, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction for confident trading, all for competitive exchange fees. It's time to make a change and give yourself an edge with Spikes. Learn more about Spikes at www.myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for information purposes only and are not intended to provide and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music can mean but one thing. It is Friday, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. Yep, it's time for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from this fine network upon which you're listening to this program and hopefully a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> I see the numbers. I know you guys are out there these days. Glad you're enjoying it. Glad you're mainlining it. Glad you're going deep into the archives on some of our shows. Glad you're discovering on new platforms, too. A whole bunch of you coming in and saying, I didn't know it was available on YouTube. Yeah, it is. It has been for a while. We just don't really talk about it, but it is there. So even longtime listeners writing to us saying, this is great. I love the YouTube. So it's been there. If you want it, it's there. Just search for us, Options Insider, over there on the old YouTubes, and you can get your shows with a fun, fancy little static gif of the cover art, if that's your thing. Hey, we don't judge. As long as you're listening, Downloading, streaming, subscribing. If you want to tune in live every Friday, that, of course, is the easiest way to get your volatility questions bumped to the top of the queue. I know a lot more of you are, are flocking into the Mixler these days as well. We're trying to keep you busy, trying to keep you informed, educated, maybe a little bit entertained. 50-50 on that, but we'll try. We can definitely do the other stuff out there. Keep you sane during all this quarantine madness out there. So keep those questions coming. We know you have been. You've been overwhelming us. We'd love to hear from you. Keep that stuff flowing. And joining me on the program today, let's see who we got. First, let's go out to the Myax hot seat once again, where we are joined by Mr. Tom Jark, the volatility product specialist over there in Myax. Sounds like we got the right guy. Tom, welcome back to the program, sir. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. I'm happy to be back. Uh, I missed last week. Uh, I know it was a good show, but um, yeah, a lot to talk about as usual. If you want, I can chime in or we'll introduce everybody else. We'll get going first, and then we'll dive into everyone's breakdown. First, let me go on out to the hinterlands here of these five, at least for the time being, maybe not for that much longer. I hear he's uh, getting ready to head on down to the southern extremes out there. He is the greasiest of meatballs. I'm not sure if they call a meatball down there. I'll have to come up with a, a Texan variant of it pretty soon. Uh, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Lyon Capital. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program how go things in the uh, the grand plan to escape Chicago? Ah, the vol at night is really high. 
in the overnight section section of trading. The regular day is kind of blase. In the overnight session of trading. There we go. See? You needed a little meatball singing in your life. We got you covered. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll try, to put a, I'll try to put a kibosh on future trading to save your ears, listeners. As we, or singing, I should say. As we keep on rolling right on into the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, everybody, welcome to the volatility review, the portion of the show where we surprise, surprise. Review what's going on in the world of volatility, trading, and trending, and analysis, and unusual activity, all that fun stuff. And it's another crazy week, another green week on the screen, which is, I don't think what any of us were really wagering, at least not to this degree, out there. Green on the broad index, little red on the vol screen out there this week. But yeah, it's a crazy one. Uh, We're coming hot on the heels of yet another unemployment Reports out there showing uh, last month 20.5 million jobs taken off the table. Unemployment threatening that 15% level out there. That's up in just two months. Isn't it crazy how the warm has turned in just two months? In February, we had a 50-year low of 3.5%. 50, 5 a year, half a century low. And threw that away in two months. And now we're up, uh, up quite a bit. It was 4.4%. In March, so it was getting a little bit more dire, but still not that bad. And this month, 14.7%. Uh, still not quite at that depression era level of 25%. Of course, there are other ways to estimate people who are in the radius of being unemployed, and those estimates get a little bit broader. But no matter how you cut it, those numbers are not good, but still a little bit, a little bit better than, again, what they were expecting, which was around that 22 million unemployment uh, level out there. So I guess when you look at it from that lens, Things are good, which is one of the reasons why the market is in the green yet again today. All is right with the world. This pandemic apparently behind us. All concerns are behind us. In fact, not only are we green today, but NASDAQ went green on the year this week. So yes, all of the madness, the turmoil, the sell-off, the annihilation of the pandemic has been erased, at least when it comes to the NASDAQ. And the S&P and others are not that far away from it either. In fact, we'll get to that a little bit later in our mailbag there about what you guys were thinking a month ago from an S&P perspective versus how you're thinking now. we got a fun poll up there. Head on over to at options on the old Twitter. It just went live before the show, so you can dive in and, and sink your teeth into that. And speaking of green, everything is green yet again today. Uh, the NASDAQ, actually the laggard today, which is a rare moment for them, up a paltry, a meager 1%. The S&P, the Goldilocks, at about 1.15%. And the Dow leading the charge today, which is also a bit of a rare flipping of the script, up about 1.3%. Seeing gold taking a bit of a break, obviously. That's what you'd expect on a day like today. I know gold has kind of been doing its own thing of late. And oil even getting a bit of a lift out there of late. The product that seems to have a hard time rallying, rallying a bit out there today. Of course, come into showtime, we saw our old friend Spikes at about a 30 handle or so. So that puts it closing in on 30 and a half. That puts it still down about eight handles from where it was this time last show. VIX Cash was at about a 29 even coming into showtime. Puts it down about nine handles from where it was last show. And our old friend VIX was at about a 116. That puts it down about five points from last show. All right, let's go back around the horn uh, the opposite of the way we came. Let's start in the land of Texas, a.k.a. Option Pit. Are you going to start calling it Option Pit, y'all, Mr. Meatball? And what's been, what's been lighting up your, your tape out there, sir? Well, I'm actually still in beautiful Riverside, Illinois, which happens to be one of the 10 towns that changed America. doesn't matter. You're a Texan to me now. So you just, you're in my mind have a giant 10-gallon hat on and chaps and spurs. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that the, for me, the most interesting piece is the giant contango between in May and the cash index that's developed. The whole curve is backward, but we've now seen June fall under. We've now seen June fall uh, or May fall under June and the cash fall under May. So you have a pretty strong and nice 
uh, can tango there in those front two months, which makes near dated owning some of these little ETFs kind of more interesting. Um, June and May both look pretty overpriced on a relative basis, which is also kind of interesting. And, you know, that that's been kind of the big driver that I've seen. Yeah, we are back in those rarefied conditions out there, at least rarefied for these days. That's usually the normal condition we're in out there in VIX futures land of a nice little healthy, robust contango. But we haven't seen it in a while. So (laughs) now it seems abnormal and somewhat strange to us out there. Tom, same question for you. What's been lighting up your tape over there this week as the old volatility product specialist in Mayax land, sir? Um, well, I mean, there's a few things I can go through. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was just, you know, from the MyX perspective, uh, they put out some of their, you know, their uh, report on uh, April volumes, which were, um, you know, quite, quite high once again, um, 630, six, I'm sorry, 63.8 million contracts traded on the month, which equates to an average daily volume of 3 million, which is about 12, a um, little, little over 12% of the, uh, the market share. Um, and just overall, U.S. equity options volumes, you know, year over year for that month, up like 50 percent, which is, uh, you know, and, and my axes are up like 70 percent overall. So, you know, still a lot of uh, a lot of volume flows going through in the marketplace. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting when I talk with, you know, just the the traders, and I guess I travel more in the index world. So most of the traders I talk to are, are index traders. But uh all I hear about is, um, you know, just low volumes, less liquidity. It's uh, it's kind of interesting because it seems like it, you, know, you look at all the stats of volumes and everywhere else, it just seems like everything is just, you know, off the charts. So, um, and then, you know, a couple of topics that keep coming up, um, just, you know, the floor reopenings, um, you know, uh, just in society in general, right? Um, getting back to getting back to normal at some point in our lives, but we'll never be normal as it was before, but uh you know, there's a lot of talk about when the floors will open up again. Um, and, yeah, one of the big things out there is uh, just, you know, you touched on it before, it's gold. I mean, gold is, um, it seems a lot of interest in, in gold. You saw, you know, you saw some quotes from um, Tudor that, uh, you know, investing in Bitcoin and rather than gold. But uh, there's still, you know, a lot of interest in that gold trade um, for an inflation hedge and a lot of the cryptos. I'll leave it there for now. And so, Tom, you can announce it here, breaking news. When is Myax reopening its trading floor, sir? <laughs> Never closed. There you go. You have that over everyone else. You have that over CME. You have that over over <laughs> over CBO and everyone else. Myax never closed their trading floor. They never opened one either. But hey, you don't have to you don't have to put that in the release. We we're touching on the futures there earlier, and it is like I said. We're, to us, kind of weird looking now, but it is somewhat more normal <laughs> for what we're used to seeing. Uh, maybe, not, maybe not to this degree, but we are used to seeing a contango out there in VIX futures land. Coming into showtime, we saw that May future at about a one and a half points premium to the cash. It seemed like everything kind of flipped from last week. Last week, it was a one and a half point discount to the cash, and the June future is about a three point premium to the cash. Last week, it was a, three, a little bit more than a three point discount, so the front portion of the curve kind of just flipped, which is kind of interesting. And also seeing while we're, while we're seeing all these volume numbers that we're seeing out here on the show today in terms of VIX and coming up later in VXX and, and everything else out there. Mr. Meatball, you said that was kind of the most interesting development you saw out here this week from an overall vol perspective. What is it that really caught your eye about the, the return of Contango in VIX land, at least for this week? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really been a weird uh, a weird period of time to be trading. All of the, you know, my opening song was obviously a parody of Deep in the Heart of Texas, but the, the point of my song was that we are seeing um, all the volatility, all the, the price action occur um, in the overnight session, not during regular market hours. And that is, you know, really odd, not something I'm used to normally seeing. And that is, you know, I think that the big, you know, my big takeaway of, of the, the way the trading action has been interday, you know, we, we kind of get a move in the direction of the overnight move and then it is taken away uh, by the end of the day. And we're kind of seeing that, that same price action right now. 
Yeah, it's yet another reason why we told people out there to, to be nimble, be cautious, be small. <laughs> so many moves happening in the after hours or indeed in the weekends where it's difficult, if not impossible, to really do much against it. Uh, so you don't want to be caught against those, particularly all you out there who like to live on the dark side, like to get aggressive harvesting your premium. Let's keep your powder dry over the weekends, folks, because we have seen, seen madness unfold out there. Let's see what madness we're seeing unfolding out there in the option side of the, the old vol space. Let's start in Spike's land. Looks like the OI is pretty similar to what we saw last week. The number one position out there are the June 95s. Number two. Got July 24 is number three. We got the June 75. So we still got some, some legacy upside position lurking out there. Still waiting for our one by two friend to, to come back. And he's probably waiting for spikes to reset a little bit again. So it has reset quite a bit, but not quite down to the levels where I think he needs it to be to start putting on that one by two again. Number four, we got the July pars. Those are still open out there, which is kind of interesting. And number, number five out there in the top five, the June 25 puts out there in spikes land let's head on out to vix options land now see what we're seeing out there so far on the tape today pretty decent day from an overall volume perspective we've got about just almost exactly a quarter of a million contracts on the tape as of a few minutes ago the adb is threatening to break 300k to the downside about 314 so we're on path to hit that pretty easily today and again that shows you how far we've fallen from a vix options perspective right now it was over a million contracts more in ADB not too long ago, about a month ago out there. So now we're back down to seasonally adjusted, let's say, January levels, or probably what you would expect more in like a July or August time frame where nothing's really happening out there as opposed to right now where we're still on the teeth of the pandemic. Vol is still moving. Vol is still afoot. I mean, people think, oh, Vol is off so much. It's off eight, nine handles since the last show. Vol is gone. No, we're still around a 30 <laughs> in spikes and in VIX. That is extremely volatile. So uh, don't let this lull you into a false sense of security that there is no more vol out there. It's certainly not an 80 like it was a month and change ago as well, but it's, it is by no means a 12 anymore either. So, so bear that in mind as we're breaking down all this vol action out here. Let's see what's lighting it up. The top 10 positions out there in VIX options land right now cost you about 113,000 contracts to break into the top 10 in VIX land right now. That's Neither really here nor there. It's not a ton. It's not not few either. It's, it's not really a, a no, noticeable kind of memorable number. We'll start off number ten. That was the July twenty eighth, and then number nine, buck fifteen of the May sixties. So still back out in the sixty strike there. That's looks like our most optimistic slash aggressive strike here in the top ten. Number eight, flipping the script the other way. One hundred eighteen thousand of the June fifteen puts. Number seven, a buck eighteen of the May thirty five puts. Interesting strikes there as well. Number six, a buck twenty of the May thirty-two halves. Number five, a buck twenty-five of the May twenty-eighths. Number four here, a buck twenty-nine of the May thirty-two half puts. Numero trace here. We got almost one hundred thirty thousand of the May thirty puts. Number two here, buck thirty of the May twenty-five puts. And around out the top ten, number one with the bullet, a paltry one hundred fifty-four thousand gets you all the way to number one in Vixland, which shows you. Kind of how light things are right now. And that gets you to the May 35 calls out there. Let's look really quickly. Actually, it's, it's exactly even, 50-50 on the top 10 calls to puts out there. So, again, shows you perhaps where our sentiment is shaking out right now. It's kind of a bit of a coin flip, at least when it comes to the top 10 out there. Mr. Meatball, you're talking about how it wasn't that, uh, that rock'em, sock'em robots of a week out there in VIX options land. Before I start breaking down the days out there, really quickly – any trades really lighten up your tape this week, sir? You know, I'm looking, and you know, the only thing I saw was there was a, a pretty decent July buyer. We're starting to see a lot of the hedging activity move to June. So we did see June buyers of like the 40s and 50s. I, I would note that, you know, we've seen ball drop from 40s to the, you know, the high 20s. And um, VBIC slash the Viking – the future name of the volatility index on spikes, uh, spikes options is, um, you know, still really high. And one other thing that's really interesting is how expensive downside is. Um, upside is still really expensive, but they have bought up a lot of downside curvature, which pretty interesting. And then finally, I would I would note that the back end, the long long dated stuff, is not moving. 
It's been 31, 32, 33, four weeks and has stayed there on today's move. So they're still, the back end of the curve is saying all is not well. The front end is saying this could be boring for a few weeks. So it, it looks like a big old time spread the market has on right now. Hmm. Are you perhaps hinting at what Option Pit has going on out there as well? A little time spread of your own? Well, I, you know, I, I do think that um, selling the October future and buying the November is a good trade on a ratio because that is just way, way, way off. And, um, you know, if our choices are really Trump or Biden, what I mean, what is the true economic risk there? You've got two two. Uh, you got a Republican and, and probably the most moderate of any Democrat that could have been gotten the nomination. So a little surprised they continue to bid up that uh, the, the October curve, which represents November elections as much as they have. Uh, you say that, and then they throw a warrant on the ticket with Biden, right? And all of a sudden, yeah, <laughs> all of a sudden. So that that's actually the key. Who is his vice president? I guess is I guess the next shoe to drop because and and or. Uh, does he drop out of the race? I don't know. Um, so th- maybe maybe that's where the risk is. They're worried some crazy progressive, not excuse me, some progressive is going to uh, you know take over the uh, the the nomination. Well, they're certainly pricing in something, and uh, <laughs> that seems to be one of the things that would certainly give the street a bit of pause out there. If, uh, and you're hearing some rumors about it. He definitely has committed to picking a woman, so she's at least. It's that basic criteria. We'll see if some others are out there. But yeah, it's probably going to be someone that I'm guessing the street's not going to like, and that's probably maybe why they're they're putting a little bit of juice. Not to said, you know how much how much impact on monetary policy does the VP have? It depends. If it's a VP like Cheney, it could be a heck of a lot. Uh, so we'll see, I suppose, in a few months once all this uh, once all this madness starts making itself known out there. Before we keep rolling with with the VIX options land, I know Tom. In your old role out there, in your former life out there, trading uh, the vol surfaces and the term structure, I know you've been watching uh, the S's term structure quite a bit out there of late. What's been catching your eye out there, sir? Oh, uh, I mean, what's catching my eye a little bit is, um, you know, a lot, I know a lot of you like to look at the uh, the VIX futures curve and things like that, but I, I typically, I, you know, also like to look at the, um, you know, just the at the money vol term structure of the index, SPX or SPIs, uh, whichever one you prefer, and you know, you definitely notice a very kind of, um, you know, somewhat normal term structure on the shorter end. Um, and it seems to, you know, as, as Mark, um, you know, mentioned too, it, it peaks in around that November, which is the high vol point from the term structure, um, you know, obviously from elections and that, that type of thing. But, um, you know, the skew component really, really messes around with the, uh, the short dated on the VIX. So it gets a little, you know, it gets a little um, interesting to look at from, 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 you know, it looks almost too flat from a VIX perspective, but um, very somewhat normal from an index, uh, at the index level from the Ethel Money uh, ball. Um, so, yeah, and one of the things I, I just, you know, I, I like to look at too is, um, you know, just over time how these things, I like, I like always like thinking of in times of stress, you have a vol cone, you know, as you know, if you look back and think about the vol cones, um, looks like a Nike swoosh symbol. And now you have more of a, you know, just the, the contango, just kind of, you know, back to normal. Um, you know, the, the levels are obviously very high elevated, but, um, you know, you can see, as, you know, um, as, as Mark also said, you know, just the market's pricing in nothing for the next, you know, low volatility for the next you know week or so. And, um, you know, from there we could see some pickup, uh, but I do see um, on gold GLD specifically uh, keeping the equity class, um, well, uh, equity ETF. Uh, that vol has been outperforming. You know, it's been going up as index and everything else has been going down. And you know, I just see there's a lot of demand for calls, a lot of demand for upside. Um, so that's you know that could be something interesting to look look at uh, for for people. Yeah, we certainly have seen that talking about Twifo. Ironically, we didn't get to gold too much on Twifo this week. You know, we let the listeners choose where we went, and they pulled us in all sorts of other directions. Not so much in the metals this week, but uh, you're right. We have been seeing that of late. A little bit of call love out there on all things gold. Let's see what – by the way, Volcones. I love the mention of Volcones. We haven't talked about them on the show in a while. That brings me back to the old, old, early launch days of Vol Views. We should talk about things like Volcones. All the times. Maybe we should bring them back into the rotation. One of my favorite, very basic, but a very useful tool that everyone seems to forget about out there, particularly when they're out there loading up on crazy premium in, let's say, an equity option right before an earnings level. A simple vol cone analysis 
may help you walk you back from the precipice of making that trade. Let's see what kind of precipice we're on today from an overall VIX options perspective and what, what lit it up this week. Overall, like we said, the ADB is down. Volume is pretty light today. We're at about a quarter of a million contracts as of a few minutes ago. The big prints out there are the May 80s, 8 18,000 of those going up, as well as 14,000 of the June 90s, and about 10,000 of the May 28 puts. So those are our big prints out there today. Yesterday was about 400,000. Looks like that was the most active day of the week with the big prints coming. About 51,000 of the July 60s uh, going up there, as well as about 39,000 of the May Oh, what do you got here? No strikes, of course, on the May anymore. May and June are 39,000 of some strike in May. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> 30,000 of a June strike as well, which for some reason is not showing up. And then uh, 28,000 of the July. 75 calls and 27,000 of the May 28 puts. So, again, those are kind of just some of the more active strikes out there. Wednesday, just a tick under 200,000 contracts. And we've got, looks like the big prints out there. We've got 25,000 of the July 70s. We've got 15,000 of the May, excuse me, November, November pars. And 15,000 of the November 65. So maybe a bit of a vertical out there. 65 par, those would be intriguing strikes if that was indeed the case. Whatever you're doing on that par strike, I'm not sure why, how much juice you're getting. I'll have to go out to know see what they're trading for, but... How much juice are you getting for that par call? Either way, if you're buying it or you're selling it. Tuesday, exactly a quarter of a million contracts on the tape. Uh, the big prints out there, we got 19,000 of the May 72 halves. We got 16,000 of the May 25 puts and 15,000 of the May 19 puts. Also worth noting about 11,000 of the June 72 halves out there. So they were uh, maybe a little bit of a roll in from May to June out there. Someone wants to keep that 72 half threatening 80 party alive, perhaps. And to Monday was. A little bit shy of a quarter million, about 223,000 contracts on the tape. The big prints out there. May 30 puts, about 18,000. We got 13,000 of the June 80 calls and 13,000 of the SEP 32 half calls as well. Let's head on out to VXX land. Come into showtime. We saw VXX at about a 35, almost 35 and a half. That puts it down a little over six handles from where it was this time last show. It had done decent paper, about 165,000 contracts. The ADV has come off a bit out there as well. It's down to about 233,000. It was well north of a quarter million not too long ago. Let's break down the top 10. Let's lighten it up out there in VXX land. Number 10 cost you 48,000 contracts to break into the top 10 in VXX. That gets you to the June 18 puts. Number 9, 49,000 of the June 31 calls. Number 8, June 25 puts, 50,000. Number 7, 53, almost 54,000 of the May 20 puts. Number 6, 54,000. June 16 puts. Number 5, 54,600 of the May 25 puts. Looks like a pretty much a put palooza out here, listeners. Uh, number 4, 54,800 of the June 23 puts. Number 3, 59,000 of the May 24 puts. Numero dos here, 61,000 of the June 20 puts. And number 1 with a bullet out there, 103,000 of the excuse me July July 35 puts 103,000 of those bad boys someone has been out in those strikes for a little bit and has been rolling out in that level so clearly he likes that level that level looking pretty good right now is we're at about a 35 right now coming into today's show the top trades out there 16,000 of the May 35 puts and about 14 almost 15,000 of the May 30 puts out there leading the dance in VXX land Mr. Meatball now that we're back in Contango land has this made your crazies in the pit chat start perking up a little bit about all things VXX, sir? Yeah, you know, we spent a decent amount of time actually looking at VXX. And the fact that near dated trades, they now have the wind back at their back. Um, you know, if, if you're going out beyond May 22nd, you don't. But if you're just going out to like regular May expiration, you do have the wind at your back as it, as it rolls. UBXY, same thing. So we actually spent a decent amount of time looking at bearish spreads in both UBXY and VXX, which, like VIX, really expensive downside. Really expensive downside. Yeah, that's been the case in, in VXX land for a while. The folks have, have grokked on to that downside trade out there in products like VXX, and they're lighting it up. Of course, these days, you're right. You got a little bit of that. Uh, you got a little bit of that tailwind now out there for the folks who liked the erosion for a while. There, it was pretty backward in Vixland, and that was causing some problems, as we saw, for those who were trying to aggressively fade out there in VXX land. This week, some of that uh, coming back your way. I know, Mr. Tom, I know you like watching 
the OTC and the large institutional products. In your time as a vol specialist, did you ever spend any time analyzing the broad universe of vol ETPs? And if so, are any of those that stand out to you, sir? Um, yeah, I've done a, I've definitely traded them all my uh, over my career and uh, been involved in a lot of them. Um, but uh, yeah, nothing that I'm really stands out to me right now that I'm following, uh, you know, per se. So I, I, yeah, nothing there for me. Uh, sorry. <laughs> You know what is there, though, is the now 10-year and two-day anniversary of an infamous event. It wasn't a vol event so much because it was so brief, but it certainly did spook the heck out of everybody. And we did see a bit of a blip on the vol front very briefly. (laughs) Of course, I'm talking about the infamous flash crash. Some look at that now as kind of the, the tipping point for where we're beginning to really see the algos starting to make their presence known out there, not always in the best way. And uh, they look back to that day. I've I've said before on this network over the course of this week what I was doing on that day. It kind of stands out for me for a couple of levels. Uh, Tom, I'm curious for you, does that that day, May 6, 2010, does that resonate to you? And if so, do you recall what the heck you were doing on that day, sir? Oh, yeah, I recall very well. I was uh, running the index desk at uh, City, trading um, Vol. (laughs) Uh, We had, um, you know, it was a pretty active day. One of of my... um, our VIX trader was focusing on the VIX products, was on jury duty, so we were pretty shorthanded, and uh, obviously it became chaotic, and um, you know, we made markets throughout the whole chaos uh, for our clients at the time, and I remember the clients saying a lot of desks had just kind of shut down, but we were kind of there, we were, um, you know, it was, a good, it was a good day for, you know, a vol trading uh, team, but, um, and then uh, working at City at the time, you know, there was some you know talk out there that you know City had a fat finger error. So we we ended up spending uh, you know overnight almost because uh, as a firm we didn't want to go out publicly saying we'd had no errors without making sure we had no errors. So we spent um, you know hours and hours at night. Everyone was going through reams of data and uh, making sure that we, there was nothing that there was no problems and we did not have any problems. So. Yeah, that was an interesting time. And then I remember listening to the uh, the audio traders' uh, little um, video uh, audio clip. Yeah, it definitely was an interesting time. Glad to hear you didn't blow out. I've heard a lot of anecdotal stories like that, like our guy, our vol trader was away from the desk that day or it was something else. Your your guy happened to be on jury duty. It seems like that was the case. I mean, it is May 6th. It's not exactly you know a rock'em, sock'em, robots typically day. For all things vol, when we don't have a pandemic or a trade war or something else driving the vol, it is usually the beginning of that season. I won't say it out loud here on the network, but that cliche season we hear so much about of uh, getting the heck out of Dodge before earnings, or I should say, before summer really kicks in. Uh, Mr. Meatball, any any memories for you on that somewhat inauspicious day back in 2010, sir? Yeah, you know, I remember trying to get stuff. Uh, I just kind of w- left uh, left the floor and I remember having a bunch of S and P puts, trying to close them and not being able to, and uh, how kind of confusing it was. And I always laugh because I think Kramer was getting on TV at the time, and he was literally like trying to buy Procter and Gamble uh, because of the way things had sold off. It was a really screwy situation. We did see the ball, the VIX go to forty five, and. You know, that that really was kind of a precursor to, you know, a year that, that did bring some volatility that culminated with, um, you know, kind of, you know, that was kind of like a, an echo, maybe a uh, uh, an aftershock of, of 08, 09. And then we got kind of the fa- final aftershock in like 2011. So it was just in, in, you know, we'd already, I think, been down on the day. So it was true, but it was, it, it, these things, even that, did not come from absolutely nowhere. It looks like you're cutting out us on us a little bit there, sir. So we'll get Mr. Meatball reconnected here. But Tom, I know it's it's so impressed, it's so ingrained in your brain. You have additional thoughts on all things flash crash, sir. Have at it. Oh yeah, I've, I've been through a lot of different events in my life, but um, now the one interesting things like Mark talked about, it was kind of the um, the beginning of what became kind of a long dated vol squeeze in the market too. There was, um, you know, first there was a, you know, that after May, there was a huge pop in long dated vol. And um, there was a lot of people getting taken out, a lot of long dated variant swaps being unwound and all this craziness. And then, um, 
And so towards the tail end of that came out, one of the long dated 10 year vol sellers of all times came out selling in, you know, massive quantities of, um, of 10 year vol, which is actually, you know, now I'm still expiring. Um, I know a lot of people are happy to have these things off their books. <laughs> um, some was in SPTR form and some was in SPX form, obviously all OTC, but, uh, you know, these things have since, um, you know, like I said, they're expiring now, but they, they caused, you know, the vol dynamic went from a, a squeeze up to a, you know, a huge seller in the back end and, um, you know, caused a lot of, uh, you know, long dated volatility P&L, I'll tell you that. Those are the interesting little nuggets that come out of events like this. Speaking of events, we got a lot on the schedule outside of everything in our usual rotation, which is pandemic and now brewing or perhaps trade war detente out there, depending on the day, what we're seeing out there. There also are some things you could focus on from a more micro perspective, like earnings. And of course, a lot of them are popping off. If you guys want the full earnings volatility breakdown, you know where to go. Theoptionsinsider.com. Click on that earnings news and analysis. Or actually, click on the options news and articles tab. And then from there, you can go to the earnings news stuff. A couple of clicks. And you'll get to it all, the earnings move, earnings move results reports, and the season report, which is growing more intriguing by the day out here. Let's break down some of the big names that are popping off this week. We had Tyson Foods, a big one to watch these days. We had Lowe's, Marathon Oil, Disney. And we have Beyond Meat, Activision Blizzard, CVS, GM, PayPal, Peloton. Who knew? Peloton, the only gym in town now, literally. <laughs> uh, Etsy Square, JetBlue, Roku, Uber, Dropbox, just to name a few out here. We got the reports Let's break down what we've got. We've got some results reports here. Let's look at uh, Grubhub first. They were popping off on the 6th. They were went into the report $50.83. They were pricing in, let's see, 9.6% from an overall expected move on a vol straddle side. And they actually delivered about 12% to the downside. So outperforming there, uh, we've got our old friend NRG, a frequent offender on the odd block there. Let's see. They were on the 7th before the bell. They closed at 32.78. They priced in not much, about 1.7%. They delivered about 2%. So kind of in line for that one. PayPal, they were on the 6th. They were priced, let's see, they closed at 128.31. They were pricing in 4.8%. They delivered, get this, 12.6%. Again, this is just in the immediate post earnings blush. They can have moved, obviously, a, a lot since then. We're just talking about the initial move. That's what the straddle is really pricing in there. 12.6%, so nearly a 3x miss there from a, an underpriced straddle there in PayPal. Square, something similar, though not quite as extreme. Square closed at $68.10. They were pricing in 6.1%. They delivered nearly 11%. So another one outperforming there from an overall straddle perspective. Let's, there's so many here to break down. Let's see if we can find... A couple more for you here. Let's. Uh, there's so many. BMY. And you know you have some. Oh, Etsy. Here on the six, they were they closed at 78 and about a quarter. They were pricing in 9.6 percent, and they delivered 2.7 percent to the downside. So interesting. A little bit of an underperformance there. Let's see where we had some more popping off over the last. There's so many tickers here. Listen again. You guys check them out for yourself. Let's give you what Uber was pricing going into their re- event. They were they closed at 27.82 at the time of this report. They were pricing in a dollar and ninety. Oh no, excuse me. They were pricing in 246. So nearly 250. In the past, they've delivered 193. So they were pricing in, kind of bucking the trend of pricing in a little bit more juice. Well, let's see with Roku. Roku's kind of been infamously volatile of late. They closed at about 127 and a half. They popped off on the seventh as well. They were they have delivered in the past twenty seven dollars and thirty five cents. They were pricing in sixteen and a quarter. So yet another one that's been under, it's been the trend so far this season, underpricing vol kind of across the board, which I think for a lot of folks is a bit surprising here. There's so many other names. Let's see if I can grab one or two more out here. It's kind of hard to scroll through all of them. In the middle of the show here, let's see, Teva, the old name a lot of people like to watch as well. They were at 10 and a half at the time of this report. They were pricing in about 7.1%. They delivered 11 and a half percent, so outperforming out there. We've seen a lot of that sector kind of really delivering a lot of performance as well. Let's see if you guys are delivering on the question front, though, because it's time for you guys to take the reins. It is time for the volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. 
It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL. Posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody. Welcome to your voicemail, your segment. I mean, the whole show is your show, but this is where you guys really get to make yourselves heard, vent your spleens, if you will, on all things vol. Let's kick it off. We uh, Speaking of anniversaries, a somewhat inauspicious one for us and for you guys as well out there in the audience, because we asked you guys almost exactly a month ago, a little bit longer now. It was a month and change now. But back on March 30th, we said, you know, at that time, the S&P had just closed 2,600, just right above it. So we thought, you know, what are you guys feeling here? Is this rally for real, or is it a bit of a dead cat bounce? And an overwhelming majority of you, over two-thirds, 67.3% to be precise, chimed in aggressively to say, yeah, this is, this is lower. This is the dead cat bounce. We're fading this. Only about, not even 13%, only 12.8% of you said this is a real, a real rally. 14% of you thought we'd be right around there. So if you add in the 67% and the 14%. Over 80% thought we would be at 2,600, if not below. Uh, so we are obviously well north of that now, north of 2,900. And nearly 6% said you were in cash. So we thought we would revisit this one. It just went live before the show, listeners. A lot of you guys are already chiming in, making your feelings heard. Uh, before I reveal what our audience is feeling out there, which is kind of interesting, uh, let's go around the horn really quickly. Maybe, Tom, we'll start with you. Do you have a thought? Like we're asking people right now, we just passed 2,900 in the S. Quite simply, same question. Where do you think we're going to be a month from now? Higher, around this level, lower, or I'm still in cash? Mr. Tom, if you have a thought, have at it. And more importantly, where do you think our audience is lining up, sir? Um, I would say the audience is probably lining up lower than 2,900. Um, I personally feel like, um, this is my personal view, is probably have a little more room to run. Um, so for the next, but it's tricky over a month's time because there's a lot of time in between that. But I'm going to say we'll be north of uh, I, just touching. I'm looking for like a, a print above 3,000. Interesting. Hey, if they were fading at 2,600, they got to hate it at 2,900, right? <laughs> Mr. Meatball, same question for you, sir. What are your thoughts? And also, what do you think our audience is feeling? Well, our audience is super paranoid. So they're still in cash. And then. I love you guys. I love you and all your paranoia. There's nothing I love more than you and your paranoia. <laughs> um, I personally am, you know, I, I think that we're going to see the wrong side of 2,500 again here, but I think that we have to see kind of maybe a little bit of a little bit more pain on the upside before we get any turnaround. I'm with Tom. I, I like the other side of 3,000. And, you know, we get there. We see all the indexes maybe get green. Um, th- then we'll see because, you know, I, I've been talking about this stock market. You'll like this analogy. So uh, many of you may or may not know that our, our co-host on a different show, The Option Block, was, is a guy named Mike Tusa who played uh, offensive lineman for um, – the Buffalo Bills and, and played in college. Big dude, really strong. And so what, what I like in this market is that on, we're playing a game of tug of war. On one end is Mike Tusa. On the other end is my son's peewee baseball team. And they're playing tug of war. Well, Mike is probably stronger than nine 10 year olds, believe it or not, because none of them really know how to get leverage and really know how to dig in and and block. And so even if they are collectively in theory stronger, they're not going to know how to take advantage of that. So Mike's going to be able to pull that rope. But what if Mike lets go of that rope? And so what we've got is really Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, or FMAGA holding this market up, really being the the, the one side of the tug of war, pulling the market along with it, whether it wants to go or not. But if, if those stocks start to let go, um, you have a real problem. And 
the fact that they're now 20% of the S&P and about 50% of the Qs, and a lot of the investing is done in index trading, we have the market kind of eating itself to the upside. So as these dollars come in to index funds and uh, in the Qs or the SPX, or they go straight into the ETF and all these inflows, the, the inflows have to buy a lot of that 20%. And that's naturally going to push them higher. And it's going to create a lot of demand in stocks that are pretty expensive and don't have that much, didn't have a lot of liquidity, but really not relative to how much they're worth. You'd be surprised how light the liquidity is on those names. And it pushes them higher. And so, you know, we talked about how back in the day, the, the XIV kind of ate itself lower, right? It kind of blew itself up. You're kind of seeing a slow burn effect in the index funds of that happening with them being so top heavy. And and I don't know that in the history of these index funds, in the history of the S&P 500, have, has 1% of the index ever made up 20% of its value. I, I would be shocked if that was the case, even in, in peak oil. I hope wherever he is right now, Uncle Mike's ears are burning, and he's saying, who, who is talking about me in relation to some 10-year-olds? <laughs> but I like, I like the analogy out there. Let's, let's see. I'll weigh in at the – I've already – I actually I haven't had a chance to vote. It's too new. Uh, I have my thoughts, but I hate, to, I hate to prejudice the polls, so I, I let them know at the end when all is said and done. But let's get out here. Let's see. Our audience, maybe this is telling in and of itself. In the early blush – still got a few days left, listen. It just went live. But in the early blush, surprisingly, surprisingly spread out with lower – Winning, which is kind of what I thought, but not by as much as you might think. Only 39.2% saying lower. Then we've got 27.5% uh, saying higher, which is much more than we had last time. And around this level, 21.6%. So you factor in the higher and at this level, you're thinking close to half the people so far are thinking we're going to be at 2,900 or above. Only 11.8% saying, well, actually, that's higher than it was before. 11.8% so now I'm still in cash. So that's about double what it was before, which... Could make some sense to see the V-shaped recovery taking some off the table until the other leg shows up. I could see that. A lot of you have thoughts on this, as you might imagine. A lot of our uh, frequent offenders, Mark Brandt, saying <laughs> this, we're going to be much higher from all the Fred's funny money. Well, there's certainly an argument to be made for that, talking about rates going negative sometime in the near future, other things like that. Uh, Ed Hale chiming in saying, fading the rallies as they tick each top, as they tick, comma, each top has been a successful strategy Thus far. Um, it, so fading the rallies as they tick each top, I guess, has been a successful strategy so far. Easy of me to say. Uh, Kid Sinclair, I love the artistic ones in our audience. He sent in a not safe for work gift. Let's just say of someone screaming that they are crapping their pants. <laughs> so clearly he's, he's feeling a little nervous at these levels out there. What do you guys think? Let us know. Uh, keep the love coming. Earlier in the show, we were talking to Mark. You were saying that... The Katango we've seen out there in VIX Futures is one of the biggest developments we've seen out here so far. And uh, I like this name, Slicey Man. <laughs> Slicey Man chiming in, listening, saying, uh, he goes, I guess that's bullish. <laughs> well, there you go. Slicey Man thinks that's bullish. Let's get to, let's see, we got a few more uh, questions. I, I want to get to some of you out here. Lance, Lance chiming in. He says, hello, Val Crew. Well, hello, Lance. Long time, first time. Oh, we, we love you guys out there. Uh, I said, love my Vol Views weekly fix. I've even traded some spikes. Look at that. Look at that, Tom. He's definitely a hardcore listener. He said, I just wanted to see if you guys caught this, and if so, what you thought of it. I thought the Canadians were Vol savvy. He sent us a link to an article. I believe this is out of Institutional Investor, breaking down what they term AIMCO's $3 billion volatility trading blunder. It's a Canadian fund here. They say it's pulled the plug on its Vol strategies following significant losses. And the article is pretty lengthy. I encourage you to check it out for yourselves here. Listen, they say the Alberta Investment Management Corp, which manages a lot of pension assets in Canada, lost billions in what they term wrong way volatility trades earlier this year. It cost them about $3 billion, what they term highly complex strategy, which they call their derivative-based portable alpha strategy overlays, which is Probably a lot of excess premium harvesting. <laughs> uh, they say that may have exacerbated the bleed. I like that. Portable alpha. We're just getting a little bit of extra bang for our buck. And the, what this is interesting to me, and I think what our listener Lance points out as well, he says, I thought the Canadians were vol savvy. Yeah, you're right. You know, the Canadian funds 
are some of the leaders when it comes to being on the forefront of what's going on in the vol space, particularly from a pension fund perspective. In fact, back in the old days when I used to go to RMC all the time, when RMC and things like that existed, there was always a separate session really for the, the Canadian funds because they were, they were on a different level than what the U.S. pension funds are up. The U.S. pension fund, you have to go to them and say, hey, maybe you should think about buying a put and then show them 20 years of back testing to explain how that won't blow them out. Whereas the, you know, the Canadian funds, they're doing vol arb and all these much more sophisticated things. And this article points that out as well. Uh, they say that uh, some of the, Canada boasts some of the world's most sophisticated and best performing public investment funds, which essentially operate like Wall Street firms but siphon profits to ex-bus drivers and retired nurses instead. Uh, they don't really say what they were up to. I think we can hazard a guess, uh, but they say that they managed and developed, quote, three equity volatility strategies across global developed and emerging markets using historical options data, volatility surface estimation, and methodology inspired by at least three types of stochastic volatility. So all that's a long way around to think, do, saying I think they were doing a little bit of the old Volcones and some premium harvesting perhaps around that. Uh, maybe, Tom, we'll start with you. Have you seen this article that Lance is referring to here, or, ha- or have you heard about this, this breakdown with this Canadian fund? And if so, do you have any thoughts, sir? Um, I did see the article, yes. I do, um, and I'm familiar with the fund. Uh, well, um, you know, the, uh, well, first of all, I'll say the Canadian pensions are, are, are great, you know, clients and derivatives users and uh, just, you know, uh, they add a lot of, I would say, liquidity to the markets in general, especially in the vol space. Um, I don't know any particulars about what this exact strategy is, but to your point, I mean, obviously it involves some kind of uh, vol selling, <laughs> option selling strategy. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I always tend to question, the, you know, the, the press and what they're missing in some of those things, too. There's probably uh, more to it than just some vol strategy, but because uh, that seems like a really big number. Um, from just an, uh, just a volatility, you know, part of the fund. I mean, I know their funds are massive, um, but uh, yeah, in general, I you know also you know second that that they are very you know the Canadian pensions can be very sophisticated. You know, they've got their long only strategies, and they've got um, some very sophisticated derivative strategies, derivative strategies as well. So. You know, they were short a bunch of SPX puts, and against it, they were short a bunch of VIX calls. <laughs> Didn't really work out too well. Mister Meatball, have you seen this? And if so, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so apparently the Alberta Teachers Fund was Texas hedging, is what you're telling me. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just guessing, but it doesn't sound too good, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't understand it. But, you know, I, I, that makes sense. Uh, some of the things, they're smarter than they are. You know, this is akin to the Orange County guy that blew up because he thought he knew more about the yield curve than the overall market. Uh, you know, it's a long-term capital management type trade. Just, uh, you know, they're right. They would win the war. They might win the war, but those battles uh, are going to cost them so much that they're not going to be able to do it. And uh, it's a huge headache when you get these type of market blowups. And they apparently did not have a plan in place. They apparently did not. Let's see if we have a plan for what the heck's going on in ball this week because it is that time, listeners. It's time for the crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. Well, spoiler alert, listeners, none of us had a plan in place for this degree of vol erasure shall we say out here. Uh, Coming into the latter portion of the show, we're seeing spikes a little bit shy of a 30 half, about 30, 37 or so. VIX cash hovering around a 29 level out there, so pretty far away from where all of us were. Our closest, and by closest, I put that in air quotes because it wasn't that close, was our guest last week, Mr. Dave of VIX Crush Infamy out there. He does like shorting himself some ball, so it doesn't surprise me that he would be the lowest of us, but even he was still many handles away. He was at a 30, he tried to cheat, tried to do a double guess of a 35 and a 34 half. Uh, so I guess in some ways he was trying to be more precise. We can give him that. Uh, so, but he was, and no matter how you cut it, he was over four handles away, even at the most optimistic there with spikes and closer to five on the other end of that. So as you know, we try to make it within one point. Even in these difficult times, we still try to make it within one point. Sometimes you waver that a little bit like we did last week because I was, like, I think, one and a quarter points away. So you've got to kind of move the goalpost a little bit for the madness that is going on right now, but certainly not five points. Then Mr. Meatball was next closest in air quotes. He was at a 37.04, so he was only eight handles away. 
And I was I was bringing up the rear this week. I was I was on the upper end of forty one and three quarters, <laughs> and I don't think no one had no one had a twenty handle anywhere in their remote view this week. So I guess that's uh, that's what we're feeling out here this week. So there are no winners at all. So I guess that means Tom, by virtue of the fact that you weren't here last week, you win. <laughs> so uh, what are you feeling for this time next week, sir? I'll take it. Um... Well, if I can, I want to add a couple points that I think. So I, I, um, this is my personal views, not of the MyX exchange, my personal views, once again. Um, I think, you know, Vol is going to continue to, to grind a bit lower. Um, so I'm going to go with like a, I'm going to go with a 27 half. And are we using spikes or VIX? That's one question I had for you. We'll allow you to make one guesstimate and we can apply it to both, make it a little easier for you. <laughs> so 27 and a half. And then, um, uh, you know, two things, I, two factors I see out there: there's zero interest rates, dividends have got cut in, you know, cut in half. Expectations are just down so much. There's zero yield out there. Everyone's going to start looking for yield. And with the equity rebound in the market, I think you're going to see uh, people putting on structures like put spread collars, which are vol selling kind of uh, hedges, uh, which will put a little more dampening on the vol as well. That's all. Interesting. So a lot to unpack there in that 27 and a half. Staying in the 20 handle, uh, Mr. Meatball, you were a distant second place. That means you get to go second uh, this week. I get to bring up the rear. Mr. Meatball, what are you feeling this time next week? Let's see. Where are we right now? 29 and About 20, a 29 in like the VIX cash and a little over 30, about 30 and a third in spikes. All right. I'm going to go. And he just guessed 27 and a half. I'm going to say 32, 32. 32-32 for the meatball. Yeah, I'm not feeling a 20 handle as well this uh, coming week. That call that, uh, call that dogged determinism, call that what you will out here. But, yeah, we have come in pretty hard. I mean, I do see what's going on. The VIX futures, I understand what's going on. I understand also how much movement it requires to maintain even a 30 ball out there. So we're not hitting that. That's, that's going to happen. So I do see that, but I do think there are – Still, I've been saying this for a little while. Now, what worked out two weeks ago, this week, not so much. <laughs> there are some other shoes to drop. Mr. Meatball, kind of, that's why I hate going last, kind of taking me out a little bit on the lows. I could kind of, I see this is where I, should I be the jerk and cut off his wings a little bit? Because I'm saying a little bit more ball than we're seeing this week, but not a ton. I'll tell you what, I'm going to say we're going to be at a 31 and a half. So that gives him a full 0.8. Uh, on the upside there for which to run. If we go north of that, he's the winner. So this is a rare moment where I'm not feeling even as much vol as the meatball, which is kind of interesting. So Mr. Meatball on the upside, 32 and about a third. I'm in the middle there, the Goldilocks, the sweet spot. Put all your money on it, 31 and a half. And bringing out the bottom yet again, our professional vol fader here, Mr. Tom, at a 27 and a half. All right, everybody. Unfortunately... And the show flies by when you're having fun. Unfortunately, that means this is the end of Volatility Views. If you listen in live, don't worry. Maybe we've uh, made some changes behind the scenes to upgrade our, our live streams. We can go a lot longer now. So maybe we'll put some other fun stuff in there for you. Keep you occupied, even though this show is going off the air in a little bit. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with Mr. Tom, sir. Folks are intrigued by all things spikes. Maybe they have questions about what's going on out there they want to ask you directly. Uh, where should they go? What should they do, sir? MyXOptions.com forward slash spikes. There you go. MyXOptions.com forward slash spikes. I couldn't have said it better myself. You head over there. You find a fun little schnazzy couple of minute video about what the heck is spikes. You see all the data you want, the settlements, the quotes, the charts, all that good stuff. Even the link to a fun little show called Volatility Views. It's all there and more. Begin your your volatility journey over there. MyXOptions.com slash spikes. And Mr. Meatball. If folks are intrigued, want to take a webinar, maybe they want to join a live trading session, maybe they want to get a sweet hat, where should they go? What should they do? Go to optionpit.com and register to get our emails, and we'll send you uh, my thoughts on volatility and on the overall market uh, multiple times a week. It's, uh, it's the best information you can get about what I'm seeing in the market. So totally go to optionpit.com and come and check us out. There you go. Optionpit.com is the place to go. And on behalf of the greasiest of meatballs, soon to be the most Tex-Mex of meatballs, and Mr. Tom and the crew over there at MyAx, and indeed myself, 
I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. And, of course, for sending in such great questions. Maybe we'll do an all Q&A. We did that this week with Twifo, and it was pretty fun. So maybe we'll do another one of those coming up. I think maybe, spoiler alert, Monday is the 900th episode spectacular for Option Block. So maybe we'll do a little Q&A love there for the listeners as well. So that could be kind of fun. Uh, so stay tuned for that. If you're listening live, maybe we'll put some other fun stuff in there for you guys to enjoy. A little boot camp, a little advisor's option, talk some ball, all kinds of good stuff. Otherwise, we'll see you back here on Monday, kicking all off again with the Option Block 900 episode spectacular. Then all the way through to Friday for more volatility views. Volatility Views is brought to you by MyAx, one of the fastest options platforms in the world. MyAx is now trading options on the Spikes Volatility Index, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction for confident trading, all for competitive exchange fees. It's time to make a change and give yourself an edge with Spikes. Learn more about Spikes at www.myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for information purposes only and are not intended to provide and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com.